let's first of all let's just look at the pattern. All right, let's start with um, in Ezekiel thirty-five. Now, and you may write, want to write that down. We'll just give you some uh, chapter headings. In fact, a lot of your Bibles even have little chapter headings. You can almost just list them together and see what happens. But up until uh, up until chapter thirty-five of Ezekiel, he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem that happened in his day, and prophecies about moral repentance to the people of his day, and also of God's challenge to the nations of the world about the kingdom of God. That basically happens in the first 33, 34 chapters. But when you, once you hit 35 and forward, he begins to concentrate on these end times prophecies. As a matter of fact, he even says that these prophecies take place because the, the destruction of Jerusalem already took place. Part of his prophecies take place before the destruction of Jerusalem. Then there's the destruction of Jerusalem during his lifetime, and that's sort of over. It takes him a year to recover, it, recover from that somehow. And after about a year of that emotional trauma, he starts looking forward and begins to prophesy about the end times. Isn't that interesting? All right. Let's look now, and let's just give a brief uh, overview. Chapter 35, he speaks of, in verse 5, evat olam, an eternal hatred, which basically comes out of Middle Eastern nations. He said there is an e eternal, illogical, insane hatred for Israel that's always been there in the past and will always be there in the future. I mean, I mean, the word jihad isn't in there, but if it's a pretty good explanation of what we're seeing today, that eternal hatred, this, this mentality didn't just start a few years, uh, 14 years ago with the Twin Towers falling in America. This has been a long time. So you see that there will be, in chapter 35, you see a movement of hatred for Israel coming out of the Middle Eastern nations. Chapter 36 speaks of a spiritual revival and a restoration in the nation of Israel. That's what we see happening now. That's the good news going on right now. God says, hallelujah. Now he says, right, I got that right when she said, I was wondering, why, were they, why is everybody getting the good news? I got it, all right. So yeah, well actually chapter 36, he starts and he says, he says, look, you sinned. He's telling the Jews, you sinned, and because of your sin, he says it's very clearly, he said, I want you to know it was because of your sin that you went into exile. And he's saying, listen, you can't get to the full blessing and, and, and restoration and glory that, and destiny I have for the nation of Israel until you recognize that we had already sinned and that we were sent into the exile because of our sin. We don't like to... We, like Jews, try to skip over that part of it and say that it's basically because of anti-Semitism, but that's not true. It was our sin that we got sent into exile. And, and he says, all the restoration I'm going to do is not for your sakes. Lo le manchen. It says, it says twice in this passage. He says, God it says, I'm going to restore you for my name's sake. And he says, this restoration will be in process. He says this. I'm going to summarize all of chapter 36 here in one minute. He said, I sent you out into the nations as punishment because you sinned. Let's get that straight. And then when you were in the nations, you did even worse. You blasphemed my name while you were in the nations. And then he says, it's not because of you that I'm going to do good, but because of my name, of my graciousness. And then he says, I will gather you back from the nations of the world. And when I gather you back, I will begin to sprinkle clean water on you. I will begin to purify you. And then I will give you a new heart. And then I will give you a new spirit. And then my spirit will dwell in your midst. And it's just a, speaking of a beautiful spiritual restoration of the nation. And he even says toward the end of that passage that I will turn Israel again to be like the Garden of Eden. Hallelujah. So we're about halfway through that process right now of God doing good things. Here's another little bit of good news for you. Amen. And now I know how to get a reaction out of you all. Okay. That with all the difficulties we've had in this war, 
and with the bad press that's coming against Israel all around the world, during this same time, God's been doing a beautiful thing on the heart of our people. I've almost never seen our people in such a state of humility and love and integrity and unity and uh, there's something beautiful that's happening. I mean, everybody's sort of praying, even people that don't really even believe in God. And it's sort of like, we need help from somewhere, you know. And uh, so it's a sweet thing. And, and there's uh, something very precious is happening. And although the world may be uh, saying bad things about us that, that happened in the war, the people in this country know that we did everything possible. We did more than everything possible. We did a 2,000% effort to try to handle this war with integrity and that there, were, there was miracle protection. I mean, you think of this whole onslaught. What did they do? It didn't, it didn't really do, okay. No, I'm not saying there wasn't anybody killed, but what the, they, they were planning a massive attack upon our nation and the, uh, the, the protection of God and, and the help with our soldiers was just wonderful. Anyway, so that was a little bit of good news that I wanted to tell you. Man, all right, I got it. We're in, the, we're in the pace now. All right, so let's go on. But after now, after that, after that, uh, this revival in Israel, which I believe we're halfway through chapter 36 right now, we're moving toward 37 and 38 and 39. What we see, it, as I see it anyway, and I'm taking the text fairly simply, in chapter 37, you have a description of the resurrection of the dead. Not only that, the dead as they get raised get supernaturally transported into Jerusalem. Of the people in, in, in Ezekiel 37, the question is, the question is, did the people at that time have any consciousness? No, no, no. Does the dead have any consciousness? Yeah, do the dead have consciousness before the time they get raised? Well, there's, a, there's very little about that in Ezekiel 37, but there is a little bit. The little bit that it says about them that they're speaking while they're dead, saying our hope has been taken away. And from that verse where they said we have no hope is where Israel gets its uh, anthem today. When we call it Hatikva, we have hope is taken from this of saying the dead say we have no hope, but we're saying we do have hope. That's where that's, where that's taken from. Did you know that? Hatikva, but not alpaim. So that, that was taken from this, but reversed, turning that into a positive thing. So there it does. Um, I would say uh, you have uh, two different sets of, of descriptions about the dead throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Some of them speaking of very conscious pleasure and very conscious pain. But there are other some passages about people sort of resting in a place of sort of semi-consciousness. Like it said when... Uh, uh, when, when Samuel came up, he said, you deserve my peace. But uh, most of it there is. But I so I think you have all three different kinds of descriptions of them. Anyway, so, but, but as you look at, there is a set of events come that come at the end of Ezekiel 36. There's a process of spiritual and physical restoration in Israel described very clearly in chapter 36. That leads up to two big events. One is described in 37 and one in 38 and 39 which I believe happened at the same time. And one is a physical resurrection of the dead with a supernatural transport into Israel. And at the same time, a massive war in which all of the nations attack Israel. Now, uh, I believe those two things, one causes the other and they're connected together. But let's, let's not worry about if we have different differences about details. Let's, uh, let's just take the, the bigness of the chapter. There is a very clear description here of resurrection of the dead. And you have a very clear description of nations from all over the world attacking Israel and details about how their weapons will be destroyed, how they're going to use their weapons after that for seven years, and how, the, how they're going to find dead bodies lying on the, on, the, on the land of Israel, how many months it's going to take them to clean that up, what's going to happen, who's going to attack, how the birds are going to react, everything. It's a very detailed about that what's going to happen. And what we see here is that in the middle of that big war, there is a supernatural intervention by God and that all these nations of the world are supernaturally defeated against incredibly difficult odds. Now that picture is one that we see throughout all the descriptions of the end times war and we believe that is the moment 
that Yeshua returns, leads armies out of heaven to destroy all the nations that have come against Israel. Hallelujah. Now, I would also say there that uh, that's good news. Good news. Amen. Just want to make sure you're with me there. All right. Now, uh, I also want to say, uh, since that's the pattern, here's give you a little key as you read the, the Old Testament scriptures. Start to notice other instances where you have the nations of the world coming up to attack Israel and there's a last moment supernatural intervention. That you might not take that as an end times prophecy, but it is. It's a, it's a historical event. For instance, there was a time, if you remember, in the time of, of uh, Chizkiah, where it's at the time of, of, of Hezekiah, when the nations of Ashur, the nation of uh, Assyria, attacked. And he didn't know what to do. And Isaiah says to him, don't worry, God's going to protect us. And they're all like, wait a minute, we're about to be slaughtered here. And he goes, he takes the letter, you remember, and he opens it up in the temple, he prays, he says, God help us. And, uh, and Isaiah has a prophecy, he says, the daughter of Zion just has to shake her head. Amen. Just, uh, girls, you've got prophetic power in your, in your hair. You can just do that. And he said, at that moment, at that moment, the, the angel of the Lord came. Who do you think that was? That was Yeshua. That was an example of the second coming. One night, he killed 185,000 Assyrians. So that's, a, that's, a, that's an example of the type of thing that can happen when Yeshua comes back. All right, so we have, let's go back. to We have Ezekiel 36. A, a physical and spiritual restoration of Israel. We're about halfway through that right now. Maybe more than halfway. And then you have these leading up this, this double event. All the nations of the world attacking in the resurrection of the dead, which at that moment is the inter, a supernatural intervention, which it doesn't say there that the Messiah comes, but that's, a, that's, a, that's an additional understanding we have from the new covenant. At that moment, when all the nations attack, the Messiah comes and the dead are raised. All that happens more or less at the same time. I don't know if it's one day or one week or ten days or a month but it, or one year, but it's basically all happening at the same time. It's all coming together in one event. Yes, sir, question? Yes, I see it as the same as Zechariah. In other words, the Gog and Magog, Zechariah 14, Revelation 19. What is all these events and many others? Again, as I say, the, the description through all the prophets and in, in historical events is all the nations of the world attack. Israel is lost, desperate. There's a crying out to God in prayer. The Messiah comes leading armies from heaven, destroys the armies that have attacked the dead are raised, transported into Jerusalem, and then there's a moment of victory and establishment of the kingdom in peace. And that is good news. Amen. All right, now, so as that happens, that's 38 and 39. Now, um, what happens in the next uh, nine chapters? That's a lot of chapters. 40, 41, all the way up through 48. We have a very detailed description of what it seems to me is what is referred to very briefly in the New Covenant, maybe three verses in the whole New Covenant, of something about the Millennial Kingdom. Now, you could disagree with me and say, this isn't the Millennial Kingdom, but I can't figure out any other way to where it fits in. So I think that you have in all these chapters a description of the Millennial Kingdom. Let's remember that during this time, Ezekiel is speaking, and he's speaking from the amount of revelation he has. He's obviously he hasn't seen 2,000 year development of the international church, of the, of the good news I mean, uh, going around the world to all the nations of the world, the outpouring of the spirit. In other words, he's got a 2,000 gap there, 2,000 year gap. God basically worked 2,000 years primarily in the nation of Israel from Abraham to the disciples of Yeshua and then primarily 2,000 years in the international community building the international church while Israel was in exile. And these two great, uh, great movements of God throughout history begin to come together as, as the gospel finishes up in the end times in all the world and God restores Israel and these, these 4,000 years come into a fullness right at this time. It's very exciting. So I'm saying that there is a whole 2,000 year prophetic perspective, heavenly and international, that Ezekiel doesn't see. So let's remember that. Don't get too narrow-minded, but don't miss it either. What I'm saying is, you, as you read these last, last nine chapters of Ezekiel, you can make two mistakes. You can get overly narrow-minded and Jewish-centered on this because it's all specifically prophesies about details about tables in the temple and how they're going to do sacrifices. You can get too overly 
uh, concentrate on that. You can miss the international outpouring of the Holy Spirit, 2,000 years of the church, uh, the Yeshua descending from heaven. Oh, but you can also make a mistake and just skip this whole thing together and think that there is no real millennial kingdom at all upon the earth. Well, let's look at this. Uh, let's look at the simplest aspects. I know when we read these chapters, people want to raise. There's some difficult points here in, in details, but let's, let's wait on the difficult details for a moment. Let's look at the overall general pattern that we agree in. After this war comes a beautiful time. The nation of Israel is reestablished and Jerusalem is reestablished as a spiritual religious worship center and also as a government center. That's a wonderful thing. Jerusalem gets reestablished as the center. Now here it just talks about Israel as a nation, but we understand here this would be for, not only for Israel, but for all the nations of the world. When Yeshua comes back with the beginning of this kingdom upon earth, the city of Jerusalem gets restored in the center of everything that happens in the world, and it is both religious and political, or let's, we would say more, it is both spiritual and governmental. It becomes the center in both ways. Yeshua as the king and as the prophet and priest, he's there. So you first of all, it, and let's just walk through this a little bit. In chapter 40 and 41, and really in 42, the first three chapters is speaking of a, a, a measurable physical restoration of, Israel, of Jerusalem with the building of a temple. And let's say to make it easier for us now, building of a worship center in the center of Jerusalem and building a, a government center in Jerusalem. This comes. Then you get to f uh, chapter 43, and the glory of the Lord returns back uh, into the city. So it's not just building it as a, as a center. The glory of the Lord comes back on the inside. It continues on with more worship will go there. And then it begins to speak of a special figure who is called the Nasi. Now the word Nasi means the lifted up one. It's translated in modern Hebrew as the president. The president of Israel is the Nasi. But it really means the lifted up one. And this figure is either Yeshua himself, which I think it must be Yeshua, or it could be a very high uh, figure that is, that is uh, like a king immediately under Yeshua. But this figure, I see this as the image of the Messiah, Yeshua, in this millennial period that he comes and the gates of the cities are closed. Once a week he walks in in a, in a procession into the city. There's a worship ceremony. And, and it's just a beautiful thing of seeing him physically walking in and out of the city, living there. Description of how many meters there will be. Where he's going to live. Where's the worship part. Where the Levites are going to stay. Where the, it's just a beautiful thing of all this, of all this happening going out uh, uh, through that. It even describes in length what will happen to resurrected uh, priests during that time and Levites. What, what about the ones that were believers? What about the ones that weren't believers? What's going to happen to them? It's it, in very much in detail. It's, very, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. And then you come toward the end of it and there's a description of the dividing of the land. It takes the land of Israel and divides it up into actually 14 sections. 12 tribes and then one for the Levites and Kohans and then one for the prince, the Nasi. He gets his own section. So it divides it up into these 14 sections. It's very nice. And then you come to the very end of the, of the, of the book of Ezekiel and it speaks of the city of Jerusalem. And let's end up with right there. So our time's almost up. In the, at the end of Ezekiel, the last description is of the city of Jerusalem. And what it describes there is the gates of the city of Jerusalem. And each of the 12 gates are named after the 12 tribes of Israel. Does that remind you of anything? Huh? Does that remind you of anything in the New Covenant? What? It speaks of uh, the New Jerusalem. In, in, at, the, at the end of the book of Revelation, think about it. I want you just to see it now. Do you see it? The end of the book of Re Revelation. The book of Revelation ends up with a description of Jerusalem restored with 12 gates with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. What do you think he got that? Did he just imagine that? You have almost the exact same thing here. He said you've got the gates of Jerusalem with, with, the, with each one named for the tribes. 
Now, there's a little difference here because this is the millennial Jerusalem, and what John saw was, the, was at the end of the, the new creation Jerusalem. And there's a difference, but one is built on the other. So what you'll have is during this time, during the millennium, there will be a, 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 a Jerusalem with 12 gates around it, each one named after the 12 tribes. And then in the new creation, heavenly Jerusalem will come with basically the same model, but with heaven and earth joined together. Now, the last thought I want to give you about this is that, watch this. There's obviously a connection between the 12 gates of the city. You've got to concentrate here. See, you're concentrating. Let me sure you get it. There's a connection between the 12 gates of the city of Jerusalem during the Messianic kingdom in the earth and the 12 partitions of the land in the land of Israel. Do you see that? In other words, each block of land, each tribe has their own section of land. And then out of that, they each have a gate in the city. I mean, obviously, all the tribes can't live in the city. But they each have their own tribal area of land. And they're each represented by a gate in the city of Jerusalem. Do you see that? So what I'm saying is there's a pattern in a small way in Jerusalem that is in a bigger way in the 12 tribes. Now, what did, you, what did Ezekiel not see, which ought to be obvious to us? Well, what about the next step outward? You see, there is places for all the nations of the world to live as well. They're also connected to Israel, which are connected to Jerusalem. So it's almost like you have three loops. You've got the city of Jerusalem, small, maybe 25,000 meters. That's not, that's not too big, you know, square. And then you have, uh, and in that you have gates representing the 12 tribes. Then all the 12 tribes have their area, but represented by just a gate in the city. And what I'm saying is then these 12 tribes are then somehow spiritually connected to the whole rest of the world of people that have come into the millennial kingdom that will see themselves connected somehow. There will be some sort of connection from the, the, tri the nations of the world to the tribes of, of Israel. There's a hint of that, by the way, when it said that Jacob had 12 sons and 70 grandchildren. And the 12 sons are the symbol of the 12 tribes. And the 70 grandsons are the symbol of the 70 nations of the world. So you go from Jacob to 1 to the 12 to the 70. You go from Jerusalem to the tribes to the nations. And it's a pattern of this and they fit together. There's no, can you see that there's no contradiction between the tribes and the city? The tribes have a small representation inside the city. Well, somehow, there's a relationship between the 70 nations around the world to the tribes of Israel, just as there were the grandsons of Jacob didn't feel rejected. They were the grandsons of the 12 sons who were connected to Jacob, which is exactly what we see. There will be the Nasi, the, the leader, Yeshua, in the center of the city. And then there will be the 12 tribes and then the 70 nations. And it's built, the, the kingdom, the messianic kingdom in the future is built on Jacob and his sons and his grandsons, which then turned into tribes and nations. And it all fits together into uh, beautiful unity when we come into it. So uh, anyway, it's, it's fun to see this when you look at this description. And if somehow we can put, match together the descriptions of the Hebrew prophets about the end times with the prophecies about the end times in the new covenant and see how they all fit together it gives us a very clear picture. So to summarize, we really believe that there's a lot of details that you have, not just in Ezekiel, but in Isaiah. Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and, and uh, Joel and all the prophets that speak, give details of the prophecies about the end times, which are very short in the New Covenant. But we believe they're all the same. Let's just summarize it this way. I'm going to give you one minute to describe it all. God built 2,000 years, built the nation of Israel so that the Messiah could come and be born here and die to give us forgiveness of sins, be raised to give us eternal life, ascended into heaven so that we could receive the Holy Spirit. And then he sent us out, sent our people, destroyed our land and sent us around the world for a good reason and a bad reason. The bad reason is because we sinned and we had to be punished in exile for about 1,800 years. But for the good news, the good reason is so that the 
salvation could go out to the nations of the world. And as that comes, God said he would bring his people back here while they were still in sin and begin to cleanse them and purify them and get them ready. And when that happens, then these end times events will take place where ultimately there will be a revival in Israel and a revival around the world. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and all the nations. The nations of the world will attack. Yeshua will return, destroy the nations that have attacked. The dead will be raised. He will come and set up his kingdom of peace on earth from Jerusalem to the tribes of Israel to all the 70 nations of the world. And there will be a thousand year period of time of peace and prosperity with a government and worship center in Jerusalem and Yeshua going in and out and visiting people around He's got a little big home right over here in Jerusalem up on the hill. Uh, but he will come and visit people. He can transport easily to wherever you live. You can live wherever you want to and get transported here for worship service or see us on live broadcast. <laughs> Hallelujah. But that's good news. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Father, we just thank you. Amen. Father, we just want to thank you uh, for you're just pulling all these pieces together of your word. Uh, in these end times. We thank you for that, Lord. Israel, the international church, the remnant, everything coming together into one. You bring them together. And Father, we didn't even mention that very special prophecy in Ezekiel of the, of the prophet bringing the two sticks together. Hallelujah. Bring it unif unity. And Lord, we're, we're even a little bit a part of that right now. Hallelujah. Now I want to end with one last thing here. I want to ask you all to stand up for a second. And... In each of these pages, now this is very exciting. I'm, I'm going to see if I can stand up here. Maybe you can move because I want you to catch me on that thing. On that. Listen, in each one of these sections in the book of Ezekiel, God says to Ezekiel, Hinabe. He, said, he commands him, he says, you must prophesy to the nations of Israel, to the mountains of Israel, to the dry bones, to Gog and Magog, to the nations. And what the context seems to be saying, God is saying to Ezekiel, this is going to come to pass. But the fulfillment of what I'm telling you will come about when you prophesy it. What's the problem? He's not here. And it didn't happen yet. But the point is, is that somebody's got to prophesy for these events to take place. And I believe that God told Ezekiel to prophesy about them so he could write it in the book and it wouldn't really take place because it was going to take place in the future and there had to be somebody or a group of people to take Ezekiel's place and stand there and read what Ezekiel said and that they would begin to prophesy it so it would take place. Are you getting what I'm saying? Is that we all here have the prophetic spirit of Ezekiel and we need to prophesy for these things to take place. Teach about them, pray about them, declare them, worship about them, prophesy them. And that is part of the process of them coming to pass. The restoration of Israel, the resurrection of the dead and the dry bones, the unity, the destruction of the forces of Gog and Magog, the coming of the messianic kingdom on earth are all will come to pass if there is somebody reading about it, understanding it, believing it, praying it and prophesying it to happen. That's exciting, huh?